Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 13 of the Book Talk Today podcast, where today we'll be joined by Bo Burlingham, editor at large of Inc. Magazine and author of five books, including Finish Big, Street Smarts, The Great Game of Business, and our book of discussion today, Small Giants, Companies That Choose to Be Great Instead of Big. Bo, it's a pleasure to have you on. Well, it's my, the pleasure is all mine, Alan. Great. Um, okay, I, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, go for it. I'm just, I'm getting the pronunciation of your name right on. <laughs> yes. So, okay. so, for, so for listeners before, um, I was just giving a brief, uh, a brief introduction into, into how to say my name. So for anyone who's listening, it's, yeah. uh, it's uh, Sean without the S and the H, <laughs> yes. which is what we established. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see, we'll see how that progresses over the conversation, Bo. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> my, mine is a little easier. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's an easier one syllable than uh, than honest. Right. Um, right. So as we discussed before the start of this podcast, you know, I, I think the book Small Giants for me when I initially read it a couple of years back definitely had an impact on me um, as someone who's definitely wants to have my own business and start my own business. One of the questions that I want to start with is just a basic one for, for anyone who doesn't know what the term small giants means. How would you define it in, in the most simplistic way? Well, small giants is a term that um, I came up with in doing the book. Actually, one of the people who was in the book, I was looking for a title. After I'd done writing the book, um, I was looking for a title for the book. And uh, one of the people who was in the book, Jay Galtz of Artist Framework in Chicago, he is a master at, uh, if, you, if you ever need a book title on, uh, he's the guy to go to. He's excellent. Okay. And so he said, well, well, why don't you talk, what about small giants? And I said, oh, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So that's how, that's how the name came about. Was it purely just from just titling the book or was it um, something that you'd experienced in your own when you were writing for um, Ink Magazine, was it just something that came about just from that well, book recommendation or was it something that was in the sort of back of your mind? Well, there is a, there is a backstory to it. Um, when I started writing the book, I, um, I had read, well, I'd written an article about Zingerman's Delicatessen actually, which is now Zingerman's Community of Businesses in Ann Arbor. And we had uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and uh, Inc. had published the article on the cover. It was called The Coolest Small Company in America. And a publisher had read the article and said, and, and contacted me and said he thought that there might be a book there. And actually, I didn't understand it first, but I agreed to go to New York to talk to him and said, well, what do you have in mind? I mean, I think there's a book here for the founders of Zingerman's, but he said, no, 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 not just about Zingerman's. You know, here you have a company that had the opportunity to get a lot bigger, a lot faster, could have easily gone national, but they decided not to because they had other goals that they considered more important than getting as big as possible, as fast as possible. And he said, you know, how many other companies, are there other companies that uh, have, uh, you know, had this same um, response to the the opportunities that, that you face when you do build a successful company. And um, I thought I'd been at Inc. Magazine at that point for 20 years, and uh, I'd seen probably thousands of companies. And frankly, I, I had no idea what the answer to that question was, whether or not there were others. So uh, we talked about it and and this and we um i said okay well i'm going to go out and see if i can find some mm -hmm. and so i began talking to people i knew and i began searching back issues of ink and other magazines like entrepreneur and so forth to, to you know to look for companies that seem to sort of fit this model the model being divine def, uh, defined by zingerman's mm -hmm. namely Zingerman's, I, I should tell your, let your readers know, your listeners know that Zingerman's had started out in 1982 as a, as a delicatessen in, 
Ann Arbor, Michigan. And his two founders, Ari Weinzweig and Paul Saginaw, had um, really been determined to create something, an, an, a, a delicatessen that was going to be great and unique. And by great, they meant one that was going to have absolutely the best products and that was going to provide the best service to customers and was going to be a great place to work for employees and it was going to be a real pillar of the Ann Arbor community and I, I, I those were really uh, sort of the kinds of companies that I were looking that I was looking for hmm. and um, so I uh, I began to, uh, with, and then, you know, after 10 years, in the, by 1992, they'd pretty much achieved that. They wanted something that would be really world-renowned for the quality of the delicatessen that they had, and, and they had achieved that by 1992. They'd been written up in Esquire magazine and Washington Post and Bon Appetit and um, Gourmet magazine and mm. um, They'd really been sort of showered with uh, praise for this uh, extraordinary delicatessen that they'd built, and they had and they had people coming to them saying, "You know, you should build other Zingerman's delicatessens all over the country." I mean, we'd like one, and people would say, well, "You know, we'd like one in Columbus, Ohio," and uh, and so they 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 were having lots of people. They could have easily franchised if they wanted, and a lot of people told them that's you know that's the obvious way to go, and uh, um, you know they could have also raised private equity and raised money and gone out and uh, opened other Zingermans. They decided that Paul and Ari decided that just wasn't what they wanted to do. That. Um, they'd started the business in order to create something great and unique. And when you start replicating something, it's no longer unique by definition. And a lot of times the new ones are really not very good. Um, and Ari said he didn't want to spend his life flying to, uh, you know, a mediocre Zingerman's in Kansas city or Beloit, Wisconsin or wherever uh and you know to see if the coleslaw was fresh and uh so so th the two of them decided okay well we do we have to do something because we don't want to stagnate here and uh we do have an opportunity to do something how can we build on what we've created and they spent really the next two years talking about that mm -hmm. uh, they would meet weekly really at least weekly to talk about you know what what can we build here and eventually they came up with a vision for the what they really wanted to do and they they published this vision in 1994 and it was their vision of what the company was going to look like 15 years in the future hmm. uh that is in 2009 and they said you know we're no longer going to be just one company. We're going to be a whole club. We're going to be a whole community of businesses. And all of these businesses are going to be in the Ann Arbor area. And all of them are going to have something to do with food. Um, and, you know, each of them, we want each of them to be great and unique in its own right. Um, and, uh, you know, this is going to give us an opportunity to actually provide better products and service to our customers. It's going to provide opportunities for our employees. Some of them may even want to start some of these companies. Hmm. And they, they said, you know, this is, this is what we think we should do. And um, so they went ahead and, and started. And by the time, by the time that I um, showed up in Ann Arbor in, uh, I guess it was 2002, um, they were already well over halfway to achieving their vision of 2009. Mm -hmm. And they had, in addition to the delicatessen, they had a bakery called, which was 
excellent and actually sold all over all over the country uh, sold its goods all over the country called Zingerman's Bakehouse mm. uh they had a fantastic restaurant called Zingerman's Roadhouse they had a gelato company that made cheese and mm. gelato um called Zingerman's Creamery um you know they had a uh a catering business um you know and a mail order business called Zingerman's Mail Order and you know it just went on and on and frankly there was no end to what they what they could do and and they were determined to sort of keep adding these companies as they went along but the thing that really struck me most about Zingerman's when I went to visit them was the quality of the people they'd managed to attract to Ann Arbor hmm. um bec- you know to take part in what was basically an exciting experiment um you know they had people who'd been partners in national accounting firms who'd left their jobs and taken a substantial pay cut in order to go to Ann Arbor and bake bread um they had uh, successful entrepreneurs who sold their companies uh because they wanted to be part of this uh exciting experiment that was going on and they this the one guy who 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 left his company and um sold his company and then be you know came to Ann Arbor to start the creamery hmm. and other people you know who had had you know very good jobs in very large companies but who just found this idea so appealing that they were willing to take substantial salary cuts in order to be part of this and i was blown away frankly hmm. by the how great these people were and how this what was then you know a very little a relatively little company you know 10 million dollars a year or, or so and uh, how it had managed to attract people of this caliber when and uh, sorry to interrupt but when you spoke to those individuals that that made that change what was their reasoning behind it what what was the core factors behind choosing to to make that decision when you spoke to them um well whatever it was they were doing it was important for them to like what they were doing i mean the woman who left the accounting firm to 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 found the bake house um she um she liked to bake you know she 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 had and Helps, but, doesn't it yes but she also she loved the culture that uh Ari and Paul had created at the delicatessen and basically it was this culture that was being replicated throughout the Zingerman's community of businesses i mean it it was extremely attractive i mean if you went to visit i mean I, I had the experience frankly uh after I went there I came back and I told my wife and I said well gee if everything goes wrong we can always move to Zingerman's and <laughs> move to Ann Arbor and and do Zingerman's because it it was just it was it was it was just very it was exciting what was going on it mm. was they, they were inventing new things they were creating new things all the time and the people who you were doing with were very very interesting and uh exciting people um so it was it was really a and 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 they were constantly implementing new management techniques that kept improving the company like uh for example my first book i wrote with uh, jack stack of springfield remanufacturing was called the great game of business and it introduced the concept of open book management well zingerman's read the book and were inspired by it and decided that they would go out and they would implement their own version of it mm-hmm. um and so you know it, not only um was this a company where people were very happy to work for it um they looked forward to coming into work in the morning mm-hmm. and really that's almost all you can ask for uh at least at least at least when it comes to work if if you if you're enjoying it so much that you really really look forward to going to work 
uh, because of what you're doing, um, then it, it doesn't get much better than that. And, you know, that's what I found with the people that I talked to, which is they really enjoyed what they were doing. And they really thought they were doing something good in the world, that they were contributing something. And it's true that um, Zingerman's did. I mean, Zingerman's, you know, started its uh, its own not-for-profit um, in which in which they 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 for both with them and and other restaurants in the area they collected the food that was perfectly good food but really couldn't be used another time mm -hmm. you know you sort of use it once and then that's it um, and they would collect all of that and then they would give it to people who were in need of food. Hmm. And uh, this was a, a tremendous project. I mean, they also supported all kinds of activities, uh, charitable activities that were, uh, and artistic activities as well, that were going on in the community. They became a very, very big part of the Ann Arbor community. To the Ann Arbor, aside from Zingerman's, is known for the University of Michigan, hmm. uh, which is located there. And um, it's undoubtedly known, or at least for a long, I don't know who, who's better known now, but for a long time, I mean, they've been the uh, home of the University of Michigan for many, many, many years. And the, the University of Michigan was so proud of having Zingerman's in their town that they, gave honorary degrees to Paul Saginaw and Ari Weinzweig. Um, but in any event, uh, you know, they, um, as I said, they were, when I went to, to look at them, they were more than halfway to their 2009 goal. And I, and I wrote this article and uh, this publisher got back to me with the idea of seeing if there were other companies that had followed a similar path. And as I say, I didn't know at the time, um, but I decided to try and find out. I thought it was a very good question. And, you know, by just doing a lot of searching and talking to a lot of people, I quickly began to realize that there were a lot more companies that had made similar choices than I had ever imagined. Um, and so I had the luxury really of choosing 14 companies that I felt, you know, fit the profile that I was looking for and that would offer me a chance to sort of look at this sort of this whole phenomenon because, you know, people, everybody talked about big business and small business and, uh, this was something different. This was something in between. I mean, these were not sort of typical small companies. These were small companies that endeavored to be the best in the world at what they were doing. I mean, they had the highest standards for them, for themselves. And um, I, I thought, okay, well, you know, to me, they all had a special quality. You know, I visited all of them, obviously, and they all had a special quality, which I had seen when I first went to work at Inc. Magazine in the early 1980s. And, you know, that was a time when the whole entrepreneurial community, the entrepreneurial economy was really being born. Um, and there were lots of companies around and, you know, before that, there had been a time when it wasn't a compliment to call somebody an entrepreneur. If you called somebody an entrepreneur, people would say, well, why don't you go get a real job? You know, if you told your parents, gee, after you graduated from college, I think I'm going to go start a company. They, you know, they would say, you're going to throw away your education. Why are you throwing away your education? Um, and that attitude towards entrepreneurs was beginning to change in the early 1980s when I went to Inc. Mm. And I had the great good fortune to be there and to get to know a lot of companies, you know, that are household names now. Um, 
you know, examples and, and, and their leaders and their leaders when they were pretty young. Hmm. So, I mean, I'm talking about Microsoft, uh, hmm. Apple, um, Patagonia, Domino's Pizza. Hmm. I mean, they're just all of these companies that are now, you know, they're, they, so they're, they're yeah, they're, they're big and they make up, they're what make up our economy. Yeah. And, uh, but they were small companies back then, or they were relatively small companies. And what I noticed about the best of them was they had this quality that if you went to visit them, you know, um, I mean, this is the body shop was another example, um, and Ben and Jerry's. Uh, if, if you went to visit them, there was something, there was this sort of electricity. It had this power of attraction. And uh, I didn't have a name for it, but I recognized it. And I think everybody who feels it recognizes it as well. And uh, it, was, it was in the course of actually interviewing one of the people in Small Giants, Gary Erickson, the founder of Cliff Bar, mm -hmm. that he, he said he talked about how uh, somebody had complimented him for deciding not to be acquired, uh, but remaining private. And and it, it pointed out, he said, he talked to one one of the, one of his competitors had been the two of his two biggest competitors had been acquired by Kraft and Nestle, mm -hmm. and they were at a trade show, and this person came up and said said you know complimented Gary on all the activity around his booth. And then he pointed over um, to one of his competitors' booths and, and, and that had been acquired. And he said, you know, they lost their mojo. And so Gary said, mojo? Gee, I wonder what that is. I, it sounds like it's important. So he, so he went back to his company and he asked all of his employees, told all his employees this story. And he said, uh, do you know companies that used to have Mojo and lost it? And he had them all write down names of various companies. And then, and then he said, well, uh, what is it? What is this Mojo? You know, did we have, do we have Mojo? And he got all, all kinds of responses. And I, I thought Mojo, that's what, that's what these companies have. And, um, that, that kind of electricity, that mm. excitement ar about them. And, uh, and I know in the book, and I know in the book, you talk about the fact that that element of culture is sort of an unwritten, it's like, yeah. it's, it's not something that is written down in a manifesto. It's something that you associate with the, with the company at, at large. It's sort of an untangible. That, that it's absolutely right. Um, the, uh, uh, the um in fact as i was writing the book since i didn't have the name small giants yet i referred to all the companies that i was writing about as companies with mojo <laughs> and 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 my question was well where did this mojo come from uh and how are these companies able to hold on to it mm. and uh, i decided to answer that question by looking at what they had in common and I came up with, uh, you know, really five different qualities, uh, well, maybe six different qualities that they all had. And that's how I structured the book. I structured the book around those different qualities. And, you know, one of them was, you know, or actually two of them had to do with the the founders and leaders, uh, particularly the founders. The founders, were, these were all companies that were started by people who had a very clear understanding of who they were, what they wanted, and why. Um, if they hadn't had that clear understanding, they wouldn't have made the choices that they did. Um, because a lot of times, you know, when they did make a choice, well, if you look at Ari and Paul at Zingerman's, when they decided not to franchise and not to go all over the country, mm. everyone said, you're crazy. You're just, you're giving up this huge opportunity. Why are you doing it? But they, they knew what they wanted. They knew who they were and they knew what they wanted to do. I mean, that was true with 
with all of the uh, people that I wrote about. Mm -hmm. You know, a second thing really had to do with um, their relationship to the communities in which they did business. It wasn't only that they gave back a lot to the communities, although they did, but it was also that the personality of the company um, was really shaped by the community that they were in so that you you couldn't really imagine them in another location because they're, they're the qualities that sort of defined the company in a customer's mind or in a employee's mind or in anybody's mind was really just so intricately tied to where they were located. Um, and then the third quality really had to do with the customers and their relationship with the customers. And what struck me was how they all went out of their way to make those relationships as personal as possible. Um, you know, even if they had thousands and thousands of customers, they still did various things to try and emphasize the personal connection hmm. between the customers and the company. And yet, oddly enough, this is not a case of the customers coming first. Customers came second in most cases. The employees came first. And, you know, when you think about it, once a company gets above a certain size, who has the relationships with the customers? It's not the founder anymore. It's, it's the employees. And if you really want to provide great service to, um, to your customers and you want to have them feel a kind of passion for your business uh, that you feel, well, you better have employees who also have that passion for the business because otherwise nobody's going to feel it. Um, and so, and then uh, the fifth one was really one, uh, you know, there are two editions of Small Giants. In the original edition, um, there was something missing. I discovered that after the book came out and when some of these companies started to run into trouble. And I realized so that when, when, I, when I redid the book with the 10th anniversary edition, I added a chapter and the chapter was called How Small Giants Fail. And it talked about, you know, you can do, have all the, do all the, want to do all the most wonderful things in the world. If you don't, if, if you know, if you're, if you're going out of business, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I identified certain qualities that I'd seen that I thought were really important uh, if you were going to stay in business. And then finally, uh, the final quality really had to do with, again, with the leaders and what the leaders felt about whatever it was that the company did. I mean, if the company made beer, for example, um, they, they, they believed passionately in not just in their product, but they loved beer. They loved the idea of uh, creating great beer. Um, you know, same thing if, if uh, you know, if you have a food company like Zingerman's, you know, you have people who are passionate about food and who not only want to have food that tastes great, but they want to know the history of the food. They want to know where the food came from. They want to know the cultures of the countries that created the different types of food and so forth. Um, you know, that's what I saw with Zingerman's. And, you know, again, with all these companies, um, I, I, I saw this sort of common factor where, you know, they, the leaders of the company and, and then through the company, the employees as well, had this passion for what they were doing. They thought it was really important and it was something that they really wanted to give to the world. And, uh, and they did. And they did through the, and that, that's where, you know, obviously some of their mojo came from. When, so in when, any event, <laughs> so those, you, those, I'm sorry, on. Sorry. Um, uh, one question I did has, when you were studying these leaders and uh, their relationship with their employees, 
and they have this passion for the business, like you were saying. Mm-hmm. When you were doing your research, how did you see them implement that? Or how did you see them transfer that passion for their own business into their employees? Because the employees is not their business. So it, there's a lot of time and effort that goes. How did you see leaders effectively implement that passion into their employees? Well, of course, with some of these companies, the um, employees were owners of the business. I mean, they, they were these were they were employee-owned businesses. Not with all of the small giants, but with a couple of them. Um, but um, it, it was re- there's also a kind of psychological ownership that happens, where um, you know, and it, it partly it has to do with being in a business that you know treats you very very well it's not only that it treats you well but it, it treats you as a grown-up it, it, it shows you respect and trust and so the you know a business a good business is what is it it's very simple it's a bunch of people who are trying to create something that has value enough value that customers are willing to pay you other people customers are willing to pay you money in fact they're willing to pay you more than it costs to produce it um, because they value um, what the business has created so much whether it's a product or a service and you know that what they pay you more is your profit that's what profit is is sort of in from that perspective is a measure of how well you're satisfying your customers um, because you know if if they don't think they're getting the value you won't they won't they won't buy it mm-hmm. nobody's forcing them to buy it um, and usually there are competitors as well as competitors are offering something better you know they'll buy that so uh, um, it was it was that that sense that that they would develop within the company that you know we're all in this together we're all trying to do something good in the world and we're joined together to do it and in order to do to do whatever it is we've decided to do uh, we each need to do our part and we need we each depend on each other to do our part and it's that which sort of it, it comes through in the whole way you structure the company, it's in the whole way that you treat the employees on a day-to-day basis. It's, um, you know, there there are a million little things that happen to a business, but you know, there there are issues like communication. Communication has to be extremely good, and it has to be extremely clear, and um, that gets harder the bigger the company becomes, um, and you really have to be passionate about it in order to do it and do it well. Um, so you know that's what I would see with these companies. When in in relation to the actual culture formation, or mm-hmm. um, how how did they manage that in when they get bigger like you were saying you, you were saying it's from a communication point of view and saying that how communication needs to improve when you were going into these businesses were their reluctance to get big or, or their reluctance to perhaps grow um, was that due to their fear that their culture would diminish well let me let me emphasize something they didn't have a reluctance to grow all of the companies I wrote about were growing. Some of them today are much bigger than they were, but it wasn't their goal. I mean, their growth was a byproduct of the other things that they did. And and their focus was on doing those other things that, um, you know, we want to create a really great product here. And, and we would like, you know, our customers to enjoy that. Uh, and um, so 
in terms of the culture, the culture, it came out of, it came out of the way that these companies did business on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, there were different things that different companies did. I mean, one of the companies, well, actually my colleague, uh, Paul Spiegelman, who together with, he and I founded what's now called the Small Giants Community. And uh, Paul had a great company. Paul had a company called Barrel, um, which if, if I'd known about it before I wrote the book, I would have included it. Mm -hmm. um, it was a it was a company that handled uh, telephone answering for hospitals, and um, uh, they they there were just all kinds of things that Paul did within this company in order to create uh, the kind of culture that he wanted to have around him, and you know obviously I think. It's probably true of most of us is that it's much more fun to work in a company where other people are having fun, you know, and uh, where other people are happy too. Yeah. Um, and that's exactly what he, he did. And, you know, he, he would do all kinds of things. He would dress up in a matador's outfit and, uh, you know, he, he would, you know, show up with all kinds of things or, they would have a costume day where they would all they would all um, dress up and, and or they would play games. You know, there were there were games that uh, that, that they played. You know, and uh, um, in fact, well, one of one of the companies. It wasn't a company that was in Small Giants, but it was a company that profoundly affected my thinking was the company that Jack Stack, who I wrote two books with, um, it, it was called originally Springfield Remanufacturing Corporation. It's now called SRC Holdings because it's grown. It's now three quarters of a billion dollars. Uh, and they really introduced what's known as open book management. That is that they get everybody in the company involved in making decisions uh, about and 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 they they provide financial information they're, they're people in the company you know they may be um a mechanic uh who's sort of turning wrenches mm -hmm. but that mechanic knows what a return on investment is knows what um you know and why these numbers are important and how they all fit together. And, you know, when you have a culture that's built around something like that, you know, you, you wind up with people who really do um, uh, respect each other and trust each other. You know, and ultimately I think that um, really the, the basis of any good culture is mutual trust and respect. And uh, I, I owe this insight to um, somebody who I have admired a long time, a professor named Dr. Ichak Adizis. And he taught me that basically a good culture is based on mutual trust and respect. And by mutual trust means that you can turn your back on somebody. You know that they're going to do the right thing and that they're, that they're going to do right by you. Um, and so, and then mutual respect comes from treating people as if there's something, you have something to learn from them. They have something to teach you, the people you run into. And so you want to listen to them and you want to learn from them. And if, if you have that in a company, as a, how you achieve that there are different ways to achieve that. But, um, you know, you take a company like Zingerman. Zingerman's is constantly coming up with uh, sort of techniques that uh, its employees can use um, to improve the business. And that, frankly, 
you know, when you have a delicatessen and you really want to have great cu customer service, well, how do you teach people that? Well, at Zingerman's, you know, they have the three steps to great customer service. And then they, it, they, they lay out exactly what are the three things you need to do to have great customer service. Um, or, um, you know, they, they have a whole process that, that, that's called, um, you know, something like six steps to bottom line change. And uh, people learn that in the company. And um, so that really what's happening with all the people in the company, including R and Paul, is that they're learning about business and they're trying to get into the excitement of building a successful business. And when you do build a really successful business, it is exciting. It's, uh, and it's something that you can take pride in. You, you know that you spent your hours um, contributing something of value to the world. I mean, you know, when I was at Inc. Magazine uh, and it was being run by the founder, Bernie Goldhirsch, that was a, a, a very big part. I mean, a, the pride that we took in putting out the magazine, it's changed a lot since then. And, you know, I'm not a good one to judge that. Um, but uh, I know that back when I was active with the magazine, um, you know, it was important to us, just as I'm sure it's uh, important to you on to have um, a great business that produces really good interviews with authors mm -hmm. and that really sort of goes into them and that you, you, and you take pride in, in that. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you do a great job. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's actually recently as part of this podcast, we've actually released a, a magazine as well. So it's, it's part of that as well. It's making sure that, you know, it's, it's a first thing for me. It's getting a team of people together. It's, um, it's very, it's community created. So it's for readers by readers. So we've got our book community contributing. We've got authors contributing and it's, it's making sure that, you know, I was speaking to, to one of my friends, she, she contributed and it's keeping the, the quality up there and keeping the consistency, but also making it inclusive for everyone involved. Because you don't want to make it just about yourself. It shouldn't. It sh the way that I've seen it, it should never be about yourself as the person that is um, leading the operation. It shouldn't be about you. It should be about how are you empowering the people that are helping you put that together. So I think I, I would. I'm going to say it because I think reading that book two years ago, although I I didn't start it immediately, it definitely was in the back of my mind, because I think as someone who wants to run their own business i think we're almost conditioned to want to think size immediately or yes. growth immediately um, whether it's capital or whether it's just popularity um, but i think the actual aspect of creating something that's actually valuable was was definitely in the forefront of my mind and it's something that is uh very interesting very interesting indeed yes yes it is and uh, you know I, I don't mean to say there is anything wrong with uh, wanting to grow a company. No, I mean, of course, yeah. It, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the more you do grow a company, presumably the more people you're going to impact and uh, the more good you're going to do in the world. Um, but so, so it's, it's, that's not a negative. It's just that, is that, is that, are you growing just for the sake of growing? Yes. Or are you growing because you there's something there's some purpose that you have as a business that you want to accomplish, and uh, that higher purpose is what really drives you, and 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 that's that's a difference. I mean, there are people, of course, who do you know they just want to make as much money as they can. I mean, Silicon Valley is loaded with young people who come out and they have some idea for a business and they try to figure out a way to get acquired uh, by one of the big companies and, uh, and, 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 and presumably make millions of dollars doing that. But, you know, that gets pretty empty after a while. Um, and, you know, really, if, if, if what you're looking for, what you're hoping for, 
is to make a difference in the world, um, which, you know, if you can do it is very, very inspiring. Then, um, you one, know. Of the, one of the questions I had was um, in the example in the book, there was an individual called Jay Galtz from the Galtz Group. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he said in he said in, in 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 the case study that you did of him he said the secret to business is in leverage and control um and the relationship between the two and i just wanted to, um, to get your take on on that relationship between leverage and control of running a successful business well jay Goltz is a very interesting guy in fact he's the one i was referring to earlier who came up with the name small giants mm. um for the book he also came up with a name for my next book, Finish Big. Um, so uh, I have tremendous respect for Jay's creativity. Um, um, he has a various um, theories about business, which most of which are very uh, commonsensical. I'm not sure what he meant in the context. I don't remember the context okay. in which he was talking about leverage and leveraging control. Um, but I think he tends to um, view the company very much as an extension of himself. And um, it is, I mean, to some extent, every business is a, an extension of the founder, but um I would say when he talks about control, he's probably talking about his ability to control things mm. in the market um, and things about the country, about the company, and uh, his ability to leverage whatever it is that he has in order to control things. Mm. I mean, that's that's a particular uh philosophy that I think Jay has, I wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, ascribe it to everybody, certainly not everybody who I wrote about in Small Giants. Mm. Yeah, it's just something that I read and I found it very interesting, especially when it came from the leverage perspective, because the way I think about also relationships to a degree is, is a leverage game. It's is who has the leverage in the relationship, not in this, not in the sort of the narcissistic sense of who has the one up on the other person. But essentially, when you're trying to sell something or you're trying to 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 get a outcome from a relationship, the the more leverage you have, the better. Well. Frankly, on it, you you can talk about this probably more than I can. Okay. More <laughs> depth, depth than I can. Okay. Okay. So, um, it was just something that I read and I, I just found interesting. And I just, it was interesting to see whether. Yeah. He, Jay is a very interesting guy. He's, he, he often says uh, interesting things. I have a friend who uh, uh, is starting a business called 21 Hats. His name is Lauren Feldman. He's an old co colleague of mine. And uh, he's, uh, he does a podcast and, and Jay is, a, is one of the regulars on the podcast. And uh, he, he always makes an impression. <laughs> I'll definitely uh, go I, check it out then. Go have yeah. a listen to Jay, definitely. And towards the end of the book, um, you allude to how leaders who start focusing too much on the bottom line on cash flow on profit margins start to lose focus on what the business actually does and what do you see as being the cures to to stop this in, in the sense of your own experience of seeing that play out well um i when you say, I, I mean, I, I guess what you're talking about is people who are obsessed with making as much money personally as they can. Exactly. Uh, yes. Well, that's a personality thing. Some people feel that way. And, uh, you know, I, I don't make judgments about them. Um, I, I just, I, I don't find, you know, I don't get very excited. I think it's hard for an employee, for example, um, to get very excited or interested in helping his boss become rich. Mm. Uh, I mean, 
if his boss wants to become rich, well, that's his business, I guess, so long as it doesn't uh, deprive me of anything that is important in my life. But uh, um, I, I, the, 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 you know, the people, when you practice open book management, you pay a lot of attention to the financials. I mean, that was, that's really the, what Jack Stack did that is amazing with, because there's, you know, historically, there's always been this sort of conflict between the, uh, the human side of the business and the financial side. And Jack basically said, well, you don't have that c conflict if everybody in the business is part of the financial side. Um, if, 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 if it, if, you know, cause it affects everybody. Um, and, um, then there's no conflict between the the financial side and the human side because all the humans are involved in the financial side. Yeah. And once you do that, that changes everything. That changes the fundamental nature of a business. And uh, there are a lot of companies in the United States and actually outside the United States as well um, that have adopted uh, this approach to running businesses, and they all, I mean, what is the, the, the uh, effect of it is to transform the culture um, and to create a higher level of mutual trust and respect inside the company. But in addition, every company that adopts this sees their profits go up. Why? Well, think about it for a second. If you've got a if you've got a company that's filled with people, hundred people say, and they have no idea what they're doing and how it affects the profits. There are a few people at the top who sort of know that stuff, and everybody else just sort of does what they're told. And you have another company alongside that's doing the exact same people, but it's got a hundred people all of whom know what needs to be done in order to maximize the profitability of that business. Which company is going to be most profitable? Mm -hmm. The one with six people uh, who know, know about what it takes to make a profit and, you know, 94 people who are sort of waiting to be told what to do mm -hmm. or the company that has a hundred people who know what it takes to make a profit. Because a lot of times, you know, profit gets made or lost in very little decisions that nobody at the top is able to see. Um, you know, I mean, it, in in the case of Springfield Rem Remanufacturing, what they did, what they do is, at least what they were doing when I wrote about them, was they were essentially recycling engines and engine components. These engines would come, these worn out engines would come in and they would take them apart. And if there were parts that were good, they would keep those. If there were parts that could be fixed, they would fix those. And if there were parts that needed to re be replaced, they would replace those. So the profit of that company is being made or lost by the judgment of the people who are making that decision. I mean, the more new parts we use, the more expensive it's going to be. Um, the more used parts that we can fix, you know, the better it's going to be for the bottom line. Um, so, and you know, when you look at any business, this is going on that everybody in the business is having an impact on, on the, the financial success of that business. But, in most companies, the ones that don't practice open book management, most of the employees have no idea how they're affecting the bottom line. And uh, I haven't, I haven't heard of open book management before, and I'm actually interested from this conversation to read about it a bit further to understand its, its key principles. How would you summarize it if you were to summarize it in in a couple of minutes? What are the key themes of open book management? Well, the the key thing is is that um, it's it, it's a it's a it's a management process 
It's a financial process and it's an education process because in order to for it to work, people have to learn a lot. I mean, the idea that, that you know you want everybody in your company to to understand what it is, how we make money, and how we generate cash, and why that's important, and why that's going to affect your job, and why that's going to affect you know the success of the business, and and you set up the business in a way that when it is successful. It comes back to uh, help everybody, you know, whether that's – there are different ways to do that. If you read The Great Game of Business, you'll see that um, the way they, they did it at SRC is they did it a couple different ways. I mean, I like to say that, you know, on, think about it this way. Mm. Think, think about a game. This is basically what SRC said to its people. They said, you know – Forget about everything you've thought about business in the past. You don't need an MBA to understand it. What you need to understand is that business is a game. And like every game, in order to play it and in order to really follow it, there are three conditions that has to exist. Number one, you have to know what the rules are. You have to know how the game is played. Number two, you have to get enough information so that you can follow the action and keep score. And number three, you have to care about whether or not you win or lose. In other words, you have to have a stake in the outcome. If, if, if you can set up a business around those three principles, then everybody can get into following the game. I, I, I look at it I mean, cricket, for example, is a sport that I love know it. nothing about. I love it. I love that cricket reference. And, and I, I mean, I have no idea. And I, and I know that the, the reason is I don't know what the rules are. <laughs> I, can, I can't tell whether somebody's winning or losing. Uh, um, and, and, and frankly, it doesn't matter to me because I don't care who wins or loses. <laughs> well, that's not the way. If I were going to be a true cricket aficionado, I would know what the rules are. Yes. Uh, I'd know how to follow the action yes. and I'd care about who won or lost. I feel the same way about baseball. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you do. I just, I look <laughs> at it and I don't, I mean, I'm a huge cricket. It's funny that you say cricket because I'm, I'm a huge cricket fan. Um, I played it as a kid, you know, county level. And um, we, I come from a subcontinental background. So cricket is like, it's in, it's in, it's in our blood. So it's funny. Right. It's funny. You right. say. I, I know. I, I mean, um, well, I have the same relationship to baseball. I grew up playing baseball and little league baseball okay. and, uh, you know, it's in my blood. So, so perhaps we could teach each other the rules of, of, of each other's sports. Right. <laughs> I, I really like those principles actually. Um, something, um, I think that's a, a, an excellent way to, to finish this conversation. I think that's something that um, a lot of our listeners are between the ages of 18 to 34. And a lot of them are very inspired by this new definition of what an entrepreneur is, as you suggesting mm -hmm. the definition of what it was like in the, um, when you were, when you were just starting Inc magazine and the definition now is it's tremendously different. Mm -hmm. And the barriers to entry, I would say, have been crushed to a degree in, in the sense that a lot of people can can start to become one um, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot easier. Um, mm -hmm. And I definitely think these principles in this book, I mean, I don't read that many quote unquote business management books, mm -hmm. but I, I have found yours to be this one, Small Giants, to be incredibly um, insightful for for individuals who are who are starting out to think about this philosophy of creating a business of, of, of value. So definitely, um, definitely one that I recommend. And I want to thank you again for your time and for this excellent conversation. Um, people can find you at uh, bowburlingham.com. And also early in the conversation, you referenced the small giants community. Can you just quickly summarize what that community is and, and how people yeah. can? Well, it, it grew out of the fact that there are people who read the book and who identified with it and they wanted to be in touch with other people who felt the same way 
And uh, one of those people, Paul Spiegelman, who I referenced earlier, came to me and said, why aren't, why aren't you setting up something? And I said, Paul, I'm a journalist. I am not a business person. I'm not an entrepreneur myself, but you are. You're a very successful entrepreneur. And if you want to do this, I will support you. And so that's what he did. And now there are, you know, several thousand people who, and, and several thousand companies that basically like this idea of way of running a business and have um, sort of banded together and come to the summit every year. There's a summit uh, of them every year and there are other activities that, that you can find out about on the website which is smallgiants.org, O-R-G. And, uh, um, you know, th there's a lot of information there. And if, if you are sort of attracted to this, and I will say that it's also international. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, you know, we have affiliates in Brazil, in Vietnam, in, uh, <laughs> in all over the world. So, um, you know, it's, if a global, it's a if, global small giants community. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, Excellent. So, uh, and we welcome all of you. <laughs> Definitely. I hope you'll come to, maybe you'll come to one of our summits on. Yes, I look forward to, I look forward to, um, to, I, I like the community aspect. I'm a big community person in the sense of when right. you, when you feel passion, passionate about something, um, I'm very much, my mind is very much is how can we get other people who are like ourselves uh, who are passionate about the same uh, endeavors together and bring the movement forward so anytime there's a solid community of, of people I'm, I'm there because you know there's there's going to be people there that are passionate and i think passion is definitely one of the things that is a motivating factor to continuing to to grow and develop so definitely look forward to to that and once again i want to thank you for your time and for your excellent conversation Thank you very much, Sean, and uh, let's keep in touch.